What's up team? Today we are talking about two column geometric proofs. Now we've talked about some two column proofs in the past, but now we're going to sp focus specifically on those that are geometric. Uh, we did a great job talking about ones that were algebraic. Now let's take it to the next level and spend some more time talking about these geometric proofs. Okay, why, why proofs? What's the point? Who cares? Great questions. So let's talk about these. The purpose of the two column proof is to lay out the steps and justifications of a mathematical problem in such a way that is neatly organized, meaning that we have all of our statements on one side and all of our reasons on the other and that they're associated with one another. So it, like, you can tell very clearly, statement one goes with reason one, statement two, reason two, etc. So they're neatly organized in such a way that the reader can follow along and be convinced that you are correct. So when you are writing your proof, you, your job is to assume that the reader is skeptical of your conclusion. You can't assume, or they're not going to assume that you're correct. They're, fr frankly, they're assuming you're wrong. Um, so it is your job to spell out every single step, exactly why you did what you did, why it's okay, and why it led you to your conclusion. So you have to use facts and reason to convince them that your solution is correct. One of the things that tends to get us hung up when we're doing proofs is that there's not necessarily uh, the same pattern or algorithm that we follow. A lot of times in math, we think like, okay, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, here's step four, boom, I'm done. Um, and like if you have an example in your notes and you get a new problem, you just plug and play the numbers and you do your, the problem that you're given just like the one you did previously. Proofs aren't that way. Uh, it, it's just, there's just not a, 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 a single correct way to complete a proof. In fact, every single proof that you're going to be given throughout this course, there are multiple correct ways to do them. So you and your BFF can be given the same exact proofs and you all, you all year long, you don't answer a single one in the exact same manner and you can both still get 100% in the course. Proofs like these, they depend on logic and they depend on, on just true mathematical statements. So even though there's not like a, a concise pattern, um, a, you know, a perfectly right way to complete any given proof, uh, they, they generally do follow some sort of progression. So the progression looks like this. Um, so I, I know here that there, there are many correct ways to complete any proof. They'll generally follow a progression that looks like this, right? So the first thing you're going to do is lay out your given information. Every proof is going to have some sort of given information. Uh, maybe you know you have some bisector. Uh, maybe you you're given some angle measure, uh, you know, or some side length, or or whatever the case may be. Um, it, it obviously it depends on context, depends what you're talking about, what sort of information you have. Um, sometimes you have multiple given statements. So the general flow, you're going to pick one of your statements, and you're gonna you're gonna build on that a little bit. So you're gonna say, you know, here's my given statement. I know it because it's given, and because this is true, this other fact must also be true. Now, because the second fact is true, then this third fact must also be true. And here's why. There's some definitions, there's some theorems, etc. So you're going to start, essentially, you're really just starting from scratch. You're starting like, here's my given information and here's what I know about it. We're going to build to a certain point. And then you might uh, insert another piece of given information. Like, okay, here's a second piece of given information that I haven't addressed yet. And because this piece is true, I can then determine that, you know, step four, step five, and step six, or whatever is also true because of these reasons, these postulates, these theorems. So you are building this argument from scratch from the very beginning. Um, it, it'd be nice if we could just be like, hey, remember a minute ago when we were talking about the thing? That's still true, so therefore this is true. And we can like sort of do that. Um, I say here, uh, the second point on number two, it says you're gonna build each proof from scratch, though your tools that you use to build will become stronger over time. So what I mean by that is if you've proven a theorem previously and it's commonly accepted that it, that theorem is true, uh, for instance, like the Pythagorean theorem, right? You can use the Pythagorean theorem as part of a proof. Uh, if you're talking about right triangles and side lengths, etc., you can say that this is true because of the Pythagorean theorem. And so you don't have to prove the Pythagorean theorem every time in the midst of a proof if it's already commonly accepted. So the tools that you build, uh, the tools that you get to build, uh, you're going to have more and more of these theorems kind of in your back pocket or as part of your tool belt that you're allowed to use when working on these proofs. 
Okay, the third place you're going to go uh, when you're working on these proofs is you're going to reach your conclusion. So you're going to lay out the given information, you're going to build on that given information, and maybe it's like, maybe it's not just one tower, but you're coming at it, you know, from a few different angles because you have a few pieces of given information, and then at the very end, you're going to piece it all together to prove what you are trying to prove. Um, so this conclusion, it depends on uh, information you've presented in your proof. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. You can't just like start saying mathy sounding things and at the very end you're like, well, these two angles are congruent and you didn't talk about those angles the whole time. So every single step depends on something that came before it uh, with the only exception being a given statement, which it depends on something that comes, you know, that depends on given information. So I've shared this uh, a, a moment ago, but proofs give us the opportunity to be creative in the context of mathematics. So we get to be creative while still following the rules of logic and being precise with our justifications, but there are multiple correct ways to solve a proof, not just a single way. So you get to kind of flex your creativity muscles here. Now, uh, the question is typically asked, is there a list of reasons or justifications that I'm allowed to use? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, there's not just a, a, a list that I can hand you and say, here you go, these are the things you're allowed to use as justifications. Um, that, the list is it's infinite. There, there's so many different things that you are allowed to use, and you're going to be constantly adding these ideas to, to kind of your tool belt of sorts. So good news and bad news. Uh, it's bad news because, well, when we're getting started, it'd be nice to look at a list, right, and be able to pick something out. Like, oh, well, I'm looking at this. Oh, that one fits. Let's use it, right? Kind of like our first quiz. I gave you a whole bunch of reasons, and you have to pick from them. Uh, when we're doing proofs, kind of, you know, as we move forward, that's just not the case. It's your job to come up with the justifications. Now, the good news with this is that you aren't limited. You can come up with any justification that fits. As long as it logically works, it's a win. Um, so the limits here are just your creativity and kind of your, your knowledge and background with these ideas that we've been studying. So any definition, any theorem, any property, any postulate is fair game. You're allowed to use any of them when you're working up through these proofs. Um, it is preferred that you use the kind of the mathy language, kind of like the, the I guess the, the proper name of the property or the theorem or whatever. Um, but really and truly, the, the goal of proofs is not to be mathy, not to be like super... Uh, I don't know, you don't need to be technical all the way. As long as your logic works, I feel like that's a win. So you, you're allowed to explain things in your own words, uh, though you should aim to explain it in kind of a mathy, technical way. Um, one, because it's kind of common consensus, people will understand it better in general. But two, it's also just more efficient. Um, say you're trying to explain like the distribution pro distributive property or something. And instead of just writing distributive property, like you, you forgot the name of it or whatever, and so you write something along the lines of, um, here I did the move where I had parentheses and I had something on the outside, so I multiplied that outside piece by each term on the inside, and that's why I got this, you know, I, that's why I reached this uh, piece of my next step. Well, that's true, that's fine. I think we all understand what happened there, but it'd be so much simpler if you just wrote distributive property, and that, that, that explains all, all of that uh, without, uh, without too many words there. Okay, let's do this example together. Um, so you'll actually, you'll find this one in your textbook, uh, but I'm not going to tell you where it is because I want you to work through it with me here. So you're given this figure here. We have two straight lines. They intersect each other. There's some angles. We have angle one, angle two, angle three. We don't know their measures. We don't really care what they are. Um, and then we're given this information. Angle one and angle two are vertical angles. Well, that's just a definition uh, because we know that vertical angles are opposite one another when two straight lines intersect. So in the same way, angle three and this unmarked angle here are, are also vertical angles. So unfortunately, that doesn't give us a lot of information. Um, so what we're trying to do here, it says prove that angle one is congruent to angle two. So prove that these two have the same angle measure. So what we are doing is we're actually proving the vertical angles theorem. Um, at the end of the day, we're going to be able to say that all vertical angles are congruent to one another because we're going to prove it using these generic angles in this situation. So we can't use that theorem as we're proving the theorem. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to work with the facts that we have. So my first statement here, um, I'm just going to write down the given information. So angle one and angle two are vertical angles. And how do I know that? Well, I know that because it's given information. 
Um, this, is, this is, frankly, it's kind of a funny proof in that we, we may not actually use this piece of given information as we proceed, but let, let's see. Let's just see what happens here. Okay, step two. We need to make some observations. We need to start connecting some dots and eventually get to the point where we can definitely conclude that angle one and angle two are congruent to one another. So for our step two here, what I would like to say is, well, I'm gonna make, make an observation about what's going on here. I know that this is a straight line and I know that there's only two angles on this line. It's just being cut off by this other straight line. So I know that on a straight line, uh, the angle measures must add up to 180 degrees because those are going to be supplementary angles. So let's make that statement with angle one and angle, th angle three saying that they are, uh, they, they, their angle measures add up to 180 degrees. So I'm going to say the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle three equals 180 degrees. And I know that because that is the definition of supplementary angles. Running out of room here, so I'm gonna abbreviate a little bit. Supplementary angles. So we know that this is true because of the definition of supplementary angles. It doesn't quite depend on the information prior to it, but it depends on a definition that we're all familiar with. It's something we've learned before. It's a true fact that's commonly accepted in mathematics. Okay, step three is gonna be super, super similar to this, and it's gonna feel funny that we have to write the whole thing out, but we do. So step three, instead of talking about measure of angle one and three being supplementary, we're now gonna talk about the fact that angles two and three are supplementary. Now we're talking about this other straight line, and that angle two and angle three are gonna be supplementary to one another. So the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three equal 180 degrees, how do we know? Same exact thing. Def of, I'm gonna abbreviate even more, sup angles. So definition of supplementary angles. We use the same exact definition twice here, but we made two separate statements that are both equally as true. Okay, now we're gonna practice, uh, we're gonna practice some algebra skills, frankly. That's what we're about to get ourselves into. We have these two equations. We know that they both end up equaling 180. An equation said that the value on the left side has the same value as the stuff on the right side. So if we had two separate expressions here that equal 180, we're going to just do a little bit of substitution and set one equal to the other. So check this out. It's going to be, um, let's see if I can fit all this in one line here. The measure of angle one plus the measure of angle three equals, uh, now the stuff from step three here, the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three. And we know that because we just did some substitution. Substu, subst, oh boy, oh boy, spelling. There we go, we use the substitution property here. And I wanna make this abundantly clear. Why is this the substitution property? Well, step two says that this stuff equals 180. Step three says that this other stuff equals 180. Well, if they both equal 180, essentially all we did is we took this stuff, measure of angle two uh, plus the measure of angle three, and we substituted in for this 180 in step two, and then we got this statement here. Uh, I understand it looks kind of gross, measure of angle one plus, plus three, equals the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three. We don't know what the measures of the angles are, so it seems kind of weird and abstract. I get that, but check this out. When we start doing a little bit of algebra, um, you'll remember that uh, if we subtract something from one side of an equation, we also have to do it on the other side, and that, that's allowed. So what we're gonna do here is we notice that there's common terms on both sides here. There's a measure of angle three, and there's a measure of angle three. So we're just gonna subtract whatever that measure of angle three is from both sides. We don't know what it is, we don't care. We just know the same things on both sides. And check out what happens here. We end up seeing that the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle two. And our justification for that step is the subtraction, subtraction property of equality. So I'm gonna abbreviate that as P-O-E. Subtraction property of equality. Now, we are super, super close to our goal. Our last statement has to be our proof statement. We're told to prove that angle one is congruent to the angle two. We're so close. We know that the measure of angle one is the same thing as the measure of angle two. And you might be thinking, well, then we're done. That, that, that means they're congruent. Well, I agree that it means that they're congruent, but we have to spell it out. Remember, 
um, the, the person who's reading the, uh, these proofs that we're creating, they're assuming that we're wrong. We have to spell out every single thing to demonstrate to them that we are indeed correct. So step six here, uh, we're, we're gonna write down the proof statement, angle one is congruent to angle two. And based on step five, we know that this is true simply because this is the definition of congruent angles. Congruent angles. So it's super, super tempting, and I get it, I can relate. It's super tempting to stop right here and be like, boom, we're done, take that proof. Um, but we need to spell it out. Our final statement needs to look like this proof statement here. So this here is a, a reasonable proof uh, to show that every vertical angle, every pair of vertical angles ever are congruent to one another. So in our example, angle one is congruent to angle two, angle three is congruent to this unmarked angle, and every single pair of, of uh, congruent angle, or sorry, vertical angles forever are gonna be congruent. Now, when you see something like this in the midst of a figure, you don't have to go through all these steps. You can now say, uh, angle one is congruent to angle two because of their vertical angles. Boom, I proved that before. And this is the proof where we're proving it before. Um, so this is like us getting a, a new, stronger tool for our tool belt, and we can continue to use these. Okay, team, our video is already getting way too long for today. I don't like making them go this long. So if you need more examples, let me know. I'll make more videos. I'm happy with that. Uh, but I want to wrap this one up because uh, it's already too long. So uh, go ahead, get to work. I believe in you. Let me know if you have questions. I got you. And uh, hey, have some fun with this. Get to you know flex your creativity muscles a little bit. Don't trip if you like think like you don't get paralyzed because you're like, oh no, I don't know how to start. I don't even know what to do. Just start doing things and see what happens. Uh, remember, we're just building building these ideas, building these arguments from scratch, um, and just start putting information down that you think is true. And and then eventually you're gonna get to the point where you're like, oh hey, that connects to this other thing, and that because of this, this is true, and that'll help uh, connect the dots for you. So the worst thing you can do is just not try. Um, but if you, if you try and, and you still get stuck, that's fine. We have time to practice. Worst case scenario is you make mistakes and we correct them and you learn something. And that's a pretty good worst case scenario. So give it a go. I believe in you.